Hello and welcome everyone. It's been like a, an exciting last couple of days, but we're getting at the end portion of our HP Innovation Week 2022. In this last portion, we have the finalists of the HP Research Awards under the category of sustainability and product development. So please uh, join me in an applause and let us welcome uh, Dr. Alice Marciniak. Dr. Alice Marciniak is currently affiliated with the University of Guelph. She, the research she performed was at University University of Laval in Quebec City. So Alice, uh, we are very glad to have you here. Congratulations. Wish you the best under this competition and please get a head started with your presentation. Thank you very much. So hi everyone and thank you all for assisting to my presentation today. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk about my work as part of the HPP Research Award. My name is Alice Marciniak. I am a new assistant professor in the food science department at the University of Guelph. And today I will present you my PhD work entitled Production of Highly Purified Fractions of Alpha Lactalbumin and Beta Lactoglobulin from Cheese Whey Using High Hydrostatic Pressure. So where does cheese whey come from? Milk is composed of very interesting nutrients like carbohydrates, fats, minerals, and proteins. And during its transformation into cheese, up to 90% of its volume is released as whey. To give you an idea, we estimate the production of whey to be around 180 million of tons per year in the world. However, this co-product is associated with very high environmental impacts, mainly due to the presence of very valuable molecules, the proteins. And why protein are so important? Simply because according to the FAO, the global population will reach up to 9.5 billions of people by 2050. Therefore, the protein demand is expected to double by then. On the other hand, protein consumption, especially from animal sources, is associated with intense environmental impacts and triggers a higher sustainable consciousness. Lastly, in 2019, up to 33% of the US household mention adopting a diet favoring freedom foods or in some other words, more sustainable. As we all know, sustainability is a very complex and wide term, but it can be defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own need. And part of the solution is using our two days co-products as a source of our need. So while in the past, whey was mainly discharged into waterways or into land, as of today, it can be used for animal feeding or for the production of whey protein isolate or concentrate for the human consumption. However, whey, which is composed of two main proteins, beta lactoglobulin and alpha lactalbumin, represents a very valuable source of essential amino acids and biological properties. The intrinsic value of whey is now well recognized and the fractionation of these two proteins remain the most valuable solution to produce high economical, functional, and biological proteins with application such as in infant development, infant formula, sorry. Indeed, alpha lactalbumin is the main protein in human milk and plays a major role in infant development. beta lactoglobulin on the other hand, is considered as a major allergen. Therefore, their separation is of high interest. Currently, the separation of alpha lactalbumin and beta lactoglobulin is performed using conventional technology such as chromatography or membrane filtration. However, the environmental impact and the lack of specificity of this process remain very limiting for the separation of these two proteins at larger scale. The idea of this project is to fractionate these two proteins using a mature, easily scalable technology with limited environmental impact such as the high hydrostatic pressure. As we all know, high hydrostatic pressure is a processing which consists of applying a uniform and instantaneous pressure, mainly for preservation purposes. But the development of new application is a major interest for the industry, and one of them being modification of the protein structure and functionality. Indeed, with the increasing pressure, HHP induces the disruption and destabilization of the chemical bonds leading to unfolding and ultimately aggregation of the proteins, but thus by maintaining the primary structure or the backbone of the protein. However, as whey protein have very different physical chemical properties, they also show very different stability toward high pressure. Indeed, the beta lactoglobulin 
is known to be less resistant and pressure induces the access to very specific region, enhancing the protein interaction and then its aggregation. On the other hand, alpha-lactabumin is quite resistant and shows very low oligomerization, even at high pressure level. Therefore, the hypothesis of this work is that the difference of barosensitivity of the whey proteins toward high hydrostatic pressure treatments can generate specific aggregates of beta-lactoglobulin, improving its fractionation from alpha-lactoglobulin. So for this project, we used a hydrostatic pressure cycle of five minutes, 600 megapascal, with different holding time from five to 15 minutes and number of cycle from one to three to induce specific aggregation of beta lactoglobulin and then induce its subsequent precipitation. To enhance the dead duration, we combine the high hydrostatic pressure with acidification at pH 4.6, either prior to the HHP treatment to destabilize the proteins or after pressurization to enhance the, the precipitation of the denatured proteins. To evaluate the impact of acidification and HHP parameters, we studied the change in conformation of whey proteins using turbidity, gel electrophoresis, and fluorescence analysis. Then we quantified yield and purity rates of both proteins in the final fractions using high-performance liquid chromatography. So in food system, turbidity is usually related to non-solubility and regarding proteins, it is well assumed that the higher the turbidity, the more denatured the protein. In that order, we measure the optical density at 360 nanometers of our initial solution at both pH 6.6 and 4.6, as well as pressure treated solution and their subsequent supernatant. As we can observe here for our control, the turbidity of the whey solution at both pH 6.6 and 4.6 remains very similar, demonstrating very little impact of the acidification itself on the protein de denaturation. However, when pressure was applied on whey at pH 6.6, we observe an increase of the turbidity with the increasing holding time and number of cycles. These results demonstrate the impact of high pressure parameters on whey proteins. On the other hand, when whey was pressure treated after acidification at pH 4.6, the increase of turbidity was independent of the holding time and the number of cycles, demonstrating the strong synergetic effect of acidification and pressurization with high hydrostatic pressure. Lastly, subsequent supernatant of pressure treated solution for both pH 6.6 and 4.6 showed very low turbidity, implying the precipitation of all the denatured proteins. So in a second step, we investigated the change in protein conformation and we analyzed the pressure treated samples using fluorescent spectroscopy. Usually, the increase and shift of fluorescence is related to unfolding and exposition of the hydrophobic core of the protein at its surface, enhancing its denaturation. Overall, the acidification of whey from pH 6.6 to 4.6 induces a slight increase of the fluorescence intensity, suggesting some conformational change following acidification. Then, the application of pressure induces a major increase of the intensity of fluorescence, along with a shift in the maximum of emission, confirming strong conformational change and protein denaturation. However, the holding time and the number of cycles appeared to be significant only for sample pressure treated at pH 6.6. Then we determined the impact of the pressure treatment on the profile and aggregation of the specific whey protein using gel electrophoresis. Basically, proteins are migrating according to their molecular weights, and the intensity of the band is related to the proportion of the proteins. Therefore, we can also identify protein aggregates if darker spots are observed. So first of all, and as observed with previous analysis, the acidification itself did not impact the protein profile of the whey. However, when whey was pressurized, we could observe the apparition of darker stains, and even more importantly, when pressure treated at pH 4.6, and thus regardless of the pressure time and number of cycles. The presence of those darker spots was also related with the presence of high molecular weight aggregates into the well of the gels. 
Comparing to other analyses, gel electrophoresis demonstrate that pressurization at pH 6.6 has very slight impact on whey proteins, as can be seen by the band intensity of alpha lactabumin and beta lactobulin in their supernatants. However, regarding pressure treated whey at pH 4.6, we can clearly see that the band corresponding to beta lactoglobulin was very faint in all supernatants, regardless of the holding time and number of cycles. This analysis confirms the strong buffer capacity of whey at its original pH. However, the prior acidification induces a destabilization of the proteins, allowing a better specific denaturation of the beta lactoglobulin after single cycle pressure treatments. Lastly, we use HPLC to quantify whey proteins in the supernatant and measure purity and yield of alpha lactalbumin, which relates to the specificity and efficiency of the process. Alpha lactalbumin yield in the supernatant remains statistically the same regardless of the pH, holding time, and number of cycles, with an average yield of 98%. These demonstrate the very low impact of HHP on alpha lactalbumin. However, when we look at the purification degree, we observe major difference between sample pressure treated at pH 6.6 and 4.6. Indeed, at pH 6.6, we can observe an increase of the purification degree related to the holding time and number of cycles. For instance, while the purity of the control is around 27%, it increased up to 38% after 15 minutes at 600 MPa, or 36% after three cycles at five minutes, 600 MPa. On the other hand, sample pressure treated at pH 4.6 show important increase of the purification rate degree, and thus regardless of the holding time and number of cycles, with an average of 78%. This high purification degree demonstrate the good efficiency of this technology for the fractionation of whey proteins. So to summarize, the acidification of cheese whey at pH 4.6 was able to specifically destabilize the beta lactoglobulin, inducing a drastic conformational change under high pressure, leading to its denaturation and precipitation. This process, combining acidification and high hydrostatic pressure cycle of 600 MPa 5 minutes, allow us to achieve efficient fractionation of the two main whey proteins to produce highly valuable protein fractions with high economical, nutritional, and functional properties, and therefore contribute in developing new application of HPP in the food sector. While the supernatant, which is enriched in alpha lactalbumin, could be used for enriching infant formula or simply for human consumption, the palette, consisting of pure beta lactoglobulin, can be reincorporated in cheese making to improve yield and protein absorption. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alice, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, it is time now for uh, a couple of questions, uh, part of the competition process. So during in your uh, research paper that you published, uh, well, if you get the admiration of the scientific community, you explain very well the mechanisms involved with our recovery, purification of these uh, proteins. But can you explain this in the uh, simplest way possible for the general audience that may be attending the, all these, all your research findings, the mechanisms that allow the the recovery, the purification of, of these proteins? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your question. So basically what's happening under high pressure is that the protein is basically unfolding and exposing all those type of regions that are uh, making it very vulnerable under high pressure. So when it's uh, exposing those regions, it allows them, those protein, beta lactoglobulin specifically to aggregate together and which make them um, not soluble. So basically, the pH at 4.6 will allow the protein to precipitate and specifically target the beta lactoglobulin to recover a pellet that will be insoluble and rich and pure in beta lactoglobulin, where the alpha lactoglobulin will remain into the, the supernatant and soluble. So we would have very two, uh, two very different fractions, the soluble and insoluble. Okay, Alice, thank you for the answer. Hope that... You can catch some more followers now from the general audience too. Uh, time for a second question. This time, are technical questions. So you talk about changes in terms of the, the solubility, the protein denaturation. Do you expect that this combined approach, pH, HPP, will modify any other 
physical chemical properties? And if so, how will this impact its application? Will it narrow or broaden the applications? That's actually a very good question and a very important thing to uh, take into account. So uh, basically for the beta lactobin fraction that is uh, non-soluble, we are expecting it to have lower um, functionality. However, the use of denatured beta lactobin is already very interested in, like for instance, in the cheese making uh, factory because they're using denatured beta lactobin for improving their yield. So it decreased the functionality for like um, techno functionality of the proteins, but then it also target its uh, use in other industry. However, regarding the supernatant that is composed mainly of alpha lactalbumin, but also of lactose and other compounds, um, I, would I would imagine that the functionality might be a little bit different. I could not pronounce myself about being better or not, but what is sure is that the alpha lactalbumin is uh, resistant enough against high pressure to keep its nativity and its biological properties. So I would say that um, the functionality would uh, not be affected that much. Okay, that's thoroughly founded and thank you for <laughs> hearing this. Uh, and for our last question, more philosophical, if possible, if you had the opportunity to continue with uh, your research project, how would you carry over? What would you be the, the next steps to, to broaden these uh, research findings? Um, actually, one of the next steps of the project at, at that time was look be, be sure that the functionality of those proteins were maintained. So um, since I finished my PhD, I didn't carry on that, that work, but that's definitely something that we, would, uh, we could look for. Um, also, the supernatant would also be very rich in immunoglobulins, and which is another protein that is very important, especially for the immune defense and etc. So that's something we could look for and be sure that uh, their properties, biological properties, are maintained, so we can really incorporate them into the um, into infant formula, for instance. And at another uh, step, that could because we still have a little bit of beta lactobulin in that supernatant, which is uh, usually an allergen for infant. So the idea would be to characterize the allergenicity of that remaining beta lactobulin prior to enriching in infant formula. Thank you again. Plenty of ideas, I guess, to, to carry <laughs> over. <laughs> exactly. There are also plenty of questions to, to, to have, but well, we are also limited on time. So we have, I appreciate again. Thank you for participating in the competition. It was a very good presentation. We should the best uh, in front of the, of the jury. And well, ladies and gentlemen, just a big applause over here for virtual applause for Alison. We'll be uh, carrying over for our second speaker. Well, hello everyone. I hope that you are still there. And um, please do not leave your seats as things are getting excited in this uh, 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 HPP Research Award finals uh, in terms of the category for sustainability and product development. So please uh, give a great applause and welcome our second speaker of the day. We have Ariana Cubedu from Regi Emilia. Uh, she was uh, she will be presenting, and well, she was uh, the research she performed was actually done in the University of uh, Modena. She will be talking about uh, packaging, sustainable options, and well, Ariana, again, thank you for joining. Wish you the best uh, of uh, the best luck for the presentation, and please go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning. Uh, the title of my work is a suitability assessment of PLA bottles for high pressure processing of apple juice. And uh, high, pressure, uh, high pressure processing uh, is an innovative non-thermal technology uh, used as an alternative for many products such as uh, uh, fruit juice. And uh, the principle of this uh, technology uh, is uh, an high hydrostatic pressure um, for a few seconds and uh, it is uh, um, adopted to inactivate uh, uh, microorganisms, uh, in particular vegetative forms. Uh, moreover, this technique um, uh, can preserve the natural and functional characteristic of the fresh product, and uh, uh, it could be a green solution because uh, it, we can use only water, uh, recycled water, and, uh, and uh, electricity. 
the principle uh, of this uh, technology is based on the uniformity uh, transmis transmission of the pressure um, to the entire mass of the product uh, from the, the water contained in the chamber um, of the uh, of the machine uh, to the to the product and um, the limit of this uh, tech, uh, technique is that uh, product uh, trade with uh, high uh, pressure um, um, must be stored at uh, cold uh, condition and uh, uh, this technique uh, without uh, heat treatment uh, doesn't uh, inactivate some uh, enzymes and spores Moreover, uh, the product uh, must be packed in a flexible or semi-flexible packaging that, uh, that uh, can allow the transfer of the pressure from the fluid, uh, the water uh, on the product. And um, uh, uh, generally for this uh, technique uh, is used PET, uh, but we try to use PLA uh, as an alternative to PET material. PLA is uh, an aliphatic uh, biopolyester uh, that can be synthesized um, by the uh, fermentation of uh, carbohydrate like uh, cornstarch or uh, sugarcane or by uh, chemical synthesis of, uh, um, uh, of the lactyl acid uh, uh, monomer. And uh, moreover, PLA is... Uh, um, approved by FDA and uh, is categorized uh, as a uh, grass. The limit of PLA is uh, uh, that uh, um, is an higher uh, permeable uh, to the, um, the gases, in particular oxygen, uh, so it can cause, it, uh, it can cause the oxi uh, oxi um, oxidation of the product contained within it. Uh, the objective uh, of the work um, is to access the possible use of PLA bottles as an alternative to PT ones for the packaging and HPP treatment of apple juice. Um, to, to do this, we start to analyze, uh, sorry for the presentation, but we start to analyze uh, the mechanical uh, resistance of the bottle, the microbial growth, and uh, uh, the... Um, uh, color analysis and, and space gas analysis. Um, to do this, uh, we prepare uh, 12 PET and 12 PLA bottles with an identical structure. Then PET and PLA bottles were filled with apple juice and flushed for 30 seconds uh, with nitrogen. Uh, they are capped in a nitrogen saturated chamber to allow the reduction of the amount of oxygen and its replacement with uh, nitrogen. Then uh, bottles are manually loaded into the, the basket and sent to the hyperbaric chamber uh, for a pressurization at uh, 6,000 bar for three minutes at six Celsius degree. Um, then there is a rapid uh, depressurization. And um, the pressurized and control samples are uh, sent to the laboratory and uh, storage uh, up to 28 days at 6 Celsius degrees. Uh, first of all, after HPP treatment, we analyze, uh, we analyze leak and resistance to mechanical stress of the bottle. And uh, as we can see uh, by the photos, um, uh, uh, the bottles maintain the initial structure. So uh, we can conclude that bottles um, subjected to HPP treatment uh, guarantee mechanical resistance and the capacity to return to the initial structure after uh, the HPP treatment. Then we analyze, the, we analyze the microbiological growth. In particular, microbiological analysis is, uh, um, um, was determined uh, during up to 28 days of storage after 12 hours and then after 7, 14, 21 and 28 days um, of, of refrigerated storage. And we um, control the total uh, mesophilic bacterial growth uh, through plate count agar and uh, east and mouth growth uh, through subroad dextrose agar. And uh, as we can see in the table, the untreated uh, sample uh, shows um, uh, growth uh, both in bacteria and in mouth, uh, east and mouth. 
uh, but uh, it was disactivated um, after one cycle of HPP treatment. In fact, uh, if we see east and mouth uh, growth, we can see that there isn't a growth and um, all the results is under the limit of detection. Instead, the bacterial growth um, is uh, very slightly, and also this is under the, um, uh, the limit, uh, is uh, below the detection limit. And uh, um, so we can uh, conclude that HPP treatment uh, stabilized uh, the, um, uh, confirmed the effective stabilization of uh, the product after HPP treatment. Then we start to analyze hand space gas composition, and uh, the hand space gas composition analysis is made with a conventional approach by gas chromatography and with a non destructive approach by laser spectroscopy. Um, the analysis uh, through the gas chromatography is made during uh, the 28 days in a duplicate PET and PLA bottles um, before the opening for the further analysis. And uh, here we can see that uh, oxygen after 12 hours is uh, uh, 2.8, um, and it shows uh, uh, an incomplete uh, substitution with uh, nitrogen during uh, the bottling. But we can also see a slightly um, reduction of the oxygen level uh, in the first uh, 14 days of storage. Probably uh, this. Um, um, the level um, could be attributed uh, to the equilibration between end space and liquid contained in the in the um, product, and um, uh, the oxygen level uh, can also be ascribed to a consumption uh, by biochemical reaction that uh, there is in the product. Uh, the same way, the carbon dioxide level is higher than uh, atmospheric level uh, from the first time. And so um, it could be attributed uh, to the dissolved carbon dioxide produced uh, after uh, some reaction, um, some fermentation in time lapse to uh, the um, pressing of the juice and the HPP treatment. Um, the analysis uh, is uh, replicated uh, uh, through the laser spectroscopy. In particular, for this analysis, we used um, empty bottles uh, in PLA and, PL and uh, PET and uh, um, water filled bottles. And um, every bottle is put on the laser source, and uh, we have the measurement in 20 seconds. Uh, first of all, uh, there is the measurement of the temperature, and then uh, there is the result in oxygen and carbon dioxide level. And uh, as we can see, um, a water filled uh, uh, bottles, both PET and PLA bottle filled, filled water uh, bottles, um, have the highest value of uh, oxygen percent. Instead, uh, empty bottle uh, maintain very low um, oxygen levels, uh, irrespective of the polymer nature of the bottle, of the material of the bottle. Uh, the last analysis is the colorimetric analysis made by chroma meter portable color, uh, colorimeter. And uh, we made this analysis because the color is a key factor in the quality perception by consumer and uh, in uh, the choice. And uh, in particular, we analyze likeness uh, index, uh, blueness, yellowness index, and uh, greenness, redness index. The likeness index uh, uh, continues to grow, uh, to grow during uh, 28 uh, um, days of storage. And um, um, the, this event is uh, likely to take place in HP trade uh, product because uh, we know that uh, uh, HPP treatment uh, has not effective or, all, or, or only partially effective in the inactivation of the enzymes. And in this case, uh, pectin methylesterase could be um, could catalyze the desterification of the uh, pectins that are responsible of the cloudiness of the juice. Another uh, interesting index is the yellowness. Yellowness is another index connected to the quality acceptance of, by the consumer. And uh, for example, yellowness uh, degrees with um, 
um, yellow nest index uh, um, is di directly correlated with the, the, the quality. And uh, for example, the carotenoid, uh, carotenoids uh, oxidation during storage lead a uh, leads to a decrease in yellowness. And um, in this case, yellowness index uh, at the first time um, before the HPP -H treatment was 28.18, and it remained um, the same level, um, also with a slightly reduction during the 28 days of storage. In conclusion, we can say that the result confirm the technological suitability of PLA battles as an alternative to PT ones for the packaging and treatment of apple juice with high precious processing and for maintaining quality in refriger refrigerated condition. Um, uh, today, consumer choices are driven uh, both by quality uh, related factor but um, also by environmental uh, sustain sustainability aspect and um, especially related to the packaging system. So uh, the possibility to couple uh, HPP treatment, uh, so an innovative uh, um, technique with a green solution packaging uh, could be, um, could be a very a solution for um, the beverage or juice uh, that have uh, that um, are characterized uh, by a night packaging rela uh, relative environmental impact. Um, by this, uh, through the studio, uh, through the study, we um, conclude that uh, PLA uh, could be an alternative uh, to PET uh, material due to its uh, bio-based nature, uh, compostab compostability and recyclability mechanical resistance and ability to restore the initial shape after HPP treatment and protection offered to the product um, in a, a short term uh, storage product. Uh, the study, so the study will contribute to an, exp uh, an expansion of the application uh, of the PLA for the packaging um, of food and beverage, offering opportunities uh, for innovation in a prospectivity um, of uh, environmental sustainability. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Ariana, uh, for the great presentation. It's also great. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of an application or applied research publication, so make sure to, to check it out online. Um, now we open, uh, have a couple of questions for you, if, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, in the last slide, I think you touched a little bit uh, based on this, but we're, there, there, there's lots of talk in terms of, well, uh, awareness in, uh, in terms of the uh, lesser environmental impact of plastics. Sometimes there are terms that are used interchangeably, such as recyclability, degradability, compostability. So if you can please break down the, these terms for the general audience with no technical background. And well, I think you already covered, but repeated on which categories uh, will, will PLA fall in, in terms of uh, recyclability, degradability, compostability. Okay, uh, PLA is a, um, a natural uh, material, a bialyphatic plastic, and um, it uh, could be, um, it, uh, it is categorized on uh, recyclability and compostability. In particular, also PET is uh, um, affected to recyclability. Uh, recyclability is the processing uh, in which a material uh, can reuse in another, um, in another way. Uh, the same material, uh, for example, PLA or PET, uh, could be used uh, in, um, in, um, in another way. Uh, instead, the compostability is uh, the process in which uh, the, um, there is a, a degradation of the material in a, a long period. So um, PLA uh, could be uh, put in uh, the organic waste, for example, and uh, it, uh, in the future, there is the compostability of this material because uh, it has a natural source. It can, uh, produce, it can be produced uh, by the fermentation of uh, uh, cane sugar, for example. And uh, this is the, the same of biodegradability. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the bio-based material uh, uh, such as uh, PLA is uh, this um, uh, 
capaci uh, capacity, but the difference is that compostability is uh, in a control uh, atmosphere and uh, biodegradability is uh, uh, the degradation of the material in the atmospheric condition. And PLA is also the, has also these characteristics. Okay, thank you, Adriana, Ariana, sorry for the thorough explanation. We have a second question in this regard. Well, PT is also being used not only in the HPV industry, but as a whole and for the food industry to make, well, other packaging formats. So it can be part of uh, multi-layered films. It can be used as the main uh, material or the body for tops or rigid, semi-rigid tops or trays that are used for dips, salsas, meat products, ready meals. So the challenge here is, uh, well, whether you can, what would be the, if PL, sometimes uh, this, particularly in the films, uh, PET is accompanied with other plastic polymeric materials. So the question here is whether PLA is compatible with other uh, plastic polymer materials and what would, would be the, the challenges to develop these new packaging formats uh, in which PLA is found now in example tops as part of a multi-layer film. Okay. Uh, PLA is uh, compatible. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to, to say that uh, um, PLA um, uh, can, be, uh, can be coupled with HPP treatment for the harder technology. Uh, so there is some technique, uh, some uh, principles uh, uh, that uh, produce a safe uh, product. But uh, we can also use PLA uh, with other uh, materials, uh, for example, uh, with a BOH, a BOH mm -hmm. um, to reduce uh, its permeability. But uh, we can also use, for example, oxygen scavengers uh, under the screw uh, to reduce the level of oxygen in the hand space. Uh, so we can uh, uh, increase the performance of PLA. Okay, thank you, Ariana. So time for just uh, one last question. If you had a chance to continue with your project, what will be the next uh, research steps? Okay, thank you. Ah, ah sorry. Uh, ah, okay, I would like to, uh, to continue the research. Um, I start this research uh, with a um, very oxidable product that is uh, apple juice, uh, because for me it's a sort of a challenge test. But uh, if, it's, if uh, it is possible to use uh, PLA with uh, apple juice, um, I think that uh, it is possible to use uh, this material uh, for some products uh, and treat with HPP. For example, I would like to test uh, um, the meat because uh, meat, uh, for example, meat uh, um, could be a typical product that uh, can, pay, can be paid in PLA because uh, uh, it um, maintain uh, uh, its color with uh, oxygen and uh, it could be traded with HPP to performance the uh, their characteristics. Okay, thank you, Arena. Again, we have uh, lots and lots of questions that we can continue answering, but we are limited on time. Again, thank you for participating. Wish you the best of the luck when, for the final jury decision. And for all of you in the audience, please stay tuned as we get ready to to receive our final, uh, well, last finalist over here for the sustainability and product development category of the HVP Research Awards. Again, thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Too. Hello again, and thanks to all of you behind your computer screen, your mobile, the TV in your bedroom, whatever you chose to follow the HVP Innovation Week. It has been an exciting event. We're close to getting to the end. The same thing over here with our HP Research Awards competition under the category of sustainability and product development. We had two fantastic speakers and last but of course not least, please welcome our third speaker, Rita, Dr. Rita Ignacio. So Dr. Rita Ignacio is a professor at Bella University and the research she will be presenting in was performed at Aveiro University. So Rita, the stage is all yours and good luck. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you see my full screen? It's okay? Yes, it's, uh, we can see okay. the screen. <laughs> okay. I'd like to start by thanking Imperbaric for this opportunity and Vinicio for your kind introduction. So my name is Rita Inacio and I will present some results of my PhD 
um, this presentation. It's about uh, optimization of raw youth milk, high pressure pretreatment for improved uh, production um, of raw milk cheese. Uh, this presentation is divided into four parts. Briefly, in part one, I will introduce the Serra de Estrela cheese and high pressure processing. Uh, in part one, I will, um, um, sorry, then the mine objectives. In part two, I will present some results of one study, um, HPP youth milk pretreatment at laboratory scale and at industrial dairy scale. In part three, I will present the conclusions, and in part four, I will present um, dissemination points of this work. And in last, the acknowledgements. Part one, introduction. Serra de Estrela cheese is by definition the product obtaining by slow drying of the curd, after the coagulation of raw pure youth milk, obtaining from the milking of females of Bordeleira Serra de Estrela or Churramon Gera breed and use of T cell. It is a protected designation of origin product from the center of Portugal, Europe. It is one of the most appreciated uh, traditional Portuguese cheese. Serra de Estrela cheese with 45 days of ripening is characterized by a texture close, moderately buttery, deformable and cutting, um, well, um, well connected, creamy and untoes with few or no eyes, and sensorially a smooth, clean, and slightly acidic uh, bouquet. Literature reports that the application of HPP to raw youth milk uh, as a pretreatment prior to uh, cheese, making, cheese making could uh, prompt an increment in cheese yield and contribute to a better um, quality standardization. Being interesting to, to apply in the particular case of the protected de designation of origin Serra da Estrela cheese, since um, the available uh, milk is becoming scarcer due to uh, several reasons. The study was developed to determine the best HPP condition to be applied uh, to milk as a pretreatment for subsequent uh, Serra da Estrela cheese production envisaging a um, cheese yield increment and the effect on overall cheese quality. Moving on to part two study regarding duplication of HPP to, uh, for raw milk uh, pretreatment. Firstly, at laboratory scale, an initial white screening study to uh, full, uh, to full, uh, factory, full factory design was performed with four factors. Pressure intensity between 200 and 400 megapascal, holding time 5-30 minutes, waiting time before HPP between 1 and 4, um, 48 hours, and the time after HPP between 1 and 24 hours. The result allowed to pinpoint that the yield was affected by the pressure intensity, the holding time under pressure, and the time after HPP being the most important uh, factors. Um, due to a curd yield improvement at lower pressure, 200 megapascal, a focused screening was performed uh, with pressure intensity between 100 and 400 megapascal holding time 5 minutes, 48 hours of waiting time before HPP, and 24 hours after HPP. As expected, HPP treatment at 400 MPa strongly affected microbial cell viability, in particular the beneficial microbiota that contribute positively to, to the cheese ripening process. On the other hand, better maintenance physical chemical perimeters at 100 and 200 megapascal. Based on the results obtained in the two screenings, two st uh, screening studies, an optimization approach followed, where factors to be uh, st studied include pressure intensity between 100 and 300 megapascal, 
time of HPP between 5 and 30 minutes, after 24 hours of milk collection, and the curds transformed after 24 hours of HPP treatment. The model was then optimized in order to have minimal reductions on benefit microbiota, maximal reductions of pejorative microbiota, and maximal yield. It was achieved as optimal conditions to the, the, the HPP uh, treatment at 121 megapascal for 30 minutes. The optimal conditions obtained in the optimization study was subsequently applied to a new batch of raw youth milk. The model was validated and scale-up experiment was performed. Moving on industrial uh, dairy scale in a real cheese uh, production facility, the milk was pretreatment according to previous uh, experimental design study. Then, HPP pretreated milk was used to manufacture curds, which ripened 60 days and we have the Serra de Estrela cheese. At the same time, uh, control milk and treated milk was also used to manufacture control Serra de Estrela cheeses. Regarding the results in cheese, the moisture and protein content were not affected by HPP milk pretreatment. Nevertheless, HPP pretreated milk has a, a higher calcium content than control milk, which can be to the result of the effect of HPP um, on, the, on the weakening of hydrophobic and hydrostatic interaction between uh, sumi cells leading to um, a dissolution of colloidal, colloidal calcium uh, phosphate. The yield increased around 10% in curd, 8% in ripened cheese uh, in comparison to, to control milk. Regarding the microbiota results, gram-positive bacteria, uh, lactococci blue bar, lactobacilli green bars, enterococci yellow bars, and staphylococci gray bars were affected in pretreated uh, milk, having been observed uh, 0.1 and 0.8 log cycle reductions in viable cells numbers in comparison to uh, control milk. In gram negative bacteria, Enterobacteriaceae orange bars and coliforms dark blue bars, one log cycle reductions in viable cells numbers were observed. In general, cheeses manufactured from pretreated milk and controlled milks showed no significant difference in viable sales numbers. Regarding the sensorial evaluation, um, the cheese manufactured from HPP pretreated milk showed a darker rind being in accordance with the results obtained from instrumental color analysis lower L parameter. The cheese rind um, was evaluated by the panel was more homogeneous with fewer uh, defects in comparison to controlled cheese, as you can see in the, in the photos. Both cheese revealed similar lactic acid and animal uh, odor. The cheeses manufactured from HPP pretreated milk showed a softer and more unctuous uh, texture in mouth. Nevertheless, the instrumental uh, texture profile analysis did not reveal significant differences. The sensorial attribute aftertaste was more intense in cheese manufactured from HPP pretreatment milk than the, the control ones. Part three, conclusions. Response surface design. Uh, the balance between some inactivation of, of pejorative bacteria, bacteria viable cells numbers with lower reduction in viable cells numbers of beneficial microbiota plus a good technological yield led to determine HPP um, pretreatment at 121 megapascal for 30 minutes as the optimum conditions. Industrial cheese production from uh, raw and HPP pretreated milk showed that the addition of uh, milk HPP uh, treatment 
um, step increased uh, she's yield in about uh, 10%. This is from um, HPP predetermined milk, showed a few sensorial attributes significantly different in, in comparison to control. This study led to uh, the develop of prototype chip cheese with, uh, um, with a label, black label, and a packaging box. With this product, um, I received two innovation uh, awards. The optimal conditions obtained in the optimization study was 121 megapascal for 30 minutes. However, <laughs> it is a long holding time for the, for the industry. So to become more sustainable, I changed the holding time for five minutes. And these are the predicted results. Similar yield, however, lower log cycle reductions in viable sales numbers. Those results can be um, validated in, uh, in a future uh, study. This work was already published in two scientific articles. The first one, the optimization approach, and the second one, the effect of high pressure pretreatment on, on a subsequent produced cheese. This work was presented in a webinar as a um, oral communication and in two, uh, in two posters in scientific conferences. And this is all. Thank you, Hyperbaric, for this opportunity. Um, I would like to thank uh, Catholic University in the person of Professor Ana Gomes, my PhD supervisor, and Aveiro University, Professor Jorge Saraiva, my PhD co-supervisor. IP Beja, my current affiliation, and thank you all for uh, your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank yes. you, Rita, again, for the very nice presentation. Uh, we thank now open you. the floor for, for a couple of questions. Uh, well, you already have the technical knowledge. You demonstrated this. Uh, your work has been published in in scientific literature, but now try to explain this in the simplest way, your sales pitch for an example for a dairy owner who is interested in applying this for Sarah Stella cheese. Why, how would you explain this in the simplest possible way? In a simple way. So you have the same amount of milk, but you can produce more cheese. Do you like this, this idea? So try to, 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 um, to, to well, explain a little bit or try to explain what happens really to the to the milk and what happens in milk yeah try to uh, ex extend this a little bit what happens to the milk with the hvp that that it results in a higher y yield so the the protein the um the the protein it is the same but the water uh, will be re re retained so it is the the increment of yield can be justified by the, this reason, the retention of water by sheets. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another second question. So it's not only, well, microorganisms and enzymes both play a role in the development of the characteristics of cheese. You kind of touched base a little bit in, in the characteristics, the sensory characteristics, uh, slight reduction in microorganisms. What do you think will be the effect on these protrolytic or, or lipolytic enzymes? How will this impact uh, the cheese characteristics? Uh, well, you mentioned in the example a stronger odor. Huh? Yes, I, I studied th these effects, and um, it is minor effects due to uh, the, the, um, the lower pressure use it. It is insignificant. What pressure levels would you expect uh, to this to become a notable change? probably um, up to 400 megapascal, according to the, liter the literature um, or intense uh, treatments, but uh, it'll change the proteins and uh, it, not, uh, um, it, it is uh, impossible to make cheese with uh, uh, milk coagulated due to the, the procedure. Okay, thank you for the answer. And just last one question that's been commonly asked for all the or all of our participants here, the finalists. Uh, well, how would you continue this research project if uh, you had a possibility? Oh, <laughs> uh, 
at the moment I'm not dedicated to the instigation of the application of HPP because I'm um, I was invited to teach at at uh, Polytechnical of Beja. Yeah, well, just assume that you have the possibility. Why would you continue to to the development of this? Uh, this um, so there is a lot of work that can be done. <laughs> Some of that uh, decreased the, the pretreatment HPP holding time and studied the effect of, of that in milk and in subsequent um, cheese produced. Um, this is a protected designation of the origin product. So um, it has a book of specifications with restrictive uh, manufacture steps. It is necessary to change the, the, this book more. Um, a business plan should be uh, interesting to be performed uh, to understand the economic uh, balance. So there is a lot of topics to explore in this work. Yeah, I totally agree. And so with the questions that we can keep just asking, but we are also short on time. Again, thank you, Rita, for your participation. Thank you for all of those of you behind the scenes, uh, the marketing team, our other participants. So we're getting into the uh, very end of the HP Innovation Week, but stay tuned. We have the drums rolling as the jury decides uh, which will be the, the winners for each of the, the categories of the HPP Research Awards. My name is Vinicio, and again, thank you everyone for, for attending. Have a good day. Thank you.